about two minutes away from the end of the trading day on this Monday. Scarlett Fu and Alex Steele here to take you through the closing bell. We've got a global simulcast. Let's welcome Carol Masser and Matt Miller. Uh, and in doing so, welcome to our Bloomberg Television, radio, and YouTube audiences worldwide. Manic Monday. I, we're going with the alliteration theme today. <laughs> I like that. And, but it feels like it could have been a lot worse, and we've been spared the worst, uh, given that ISM report at 10 a.m. I got to say, Matt and I have been having a lot of conversations. Like, for all of us, right, who have lived and reported during the great financial crisis, during COVID, the meltdown, um, and the shutting of the economy, this even though it felt maybe a little uncomfortable uh, at the get-go, at the beginning, I feel like it's been a lot more orderly. And we've even seen that we're off our worst levels of the day, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, overnight, when I saw um, the Nikkei open down more than 10%, I started to get really worried. And this morning was rough because futures were worse than they were on Friday. And then we opened down more than 4% on the S&P, down more than 5% on, on the NASDAQ. But you're right, Scarlett, when we got that ISM number, uh, it kind of equalized things and we felt a little bit better even though the numbers are still bad they're not nearly as bad as they were yes but or yes and i think i have to say yes and uh, I, i've been harping on this all day the systemic funds right like if you have a if you have a volatility shock and a bar shock eventually they're gonna have to keep selling and so i'm really skeptical that the selling is actually done yet and that momentum takes on momentum of its own. So it may just be a pause before something, the next wave of selling comes along. But for now, uh, we can say, we can call it a day here for Monday. Yep, we got the bells. There you have it. Volume is really high here. We're just settling out, but the S&P uh, looks to be closing down around 3%. The Nasdaq off by about 3.4%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average off by about 2.6%. Again, uh, volume pretty strong on this Monday, Carol. All right. Uh, and looking at the S&P 500, folks, we've talked about it, right? Uh, pretty broad base selling. 482 names in the S&P 500. Lower today, Scarlett, 21 to the upside. Yeah, let's take a look at the IMAP, which uh, should be pretty red across the board here, because if you slice the S&P 500 into 11 sector groups or 24 sector groups, everything is down. In fact, by 24 groups, yeah, <laughs> the, the best performing group pie. is mm -hmm. household and personal products down 1.4%. So yeah, all red, only a tomato pie there today. I love that. All right, so it made it really tough to find some gainers, but I did find a few. Uh, Kelanova up about 16%, just off its highs of the day. Top number one gainer in the S&P 500, up the most most since October of 87. Um, this, as Mars considers buying the snack maker and what could be one of the biggest deals this year. Deal talks are said to be ongoing. No final decisions have been made, according to those familiar. Uh, a deal could value Kalanova at around $30 billion. That's coming from the Wall Street Journal a little bit earlier today. On Semiconductor, again, another one, uh, an outperformer, up almost 6% at its highs today, finishing the day up 1.5%. This was among the top gainers in both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. I don't know why, to be quite honest. Uh, there was some news Friday after the close of market selling, or insider selling, which would make me think it would be down, but it's not. We did see the Sox briefly turn positive in today's session, uh, so it could be that there was just some momentum, some buying, and pushing some of these names higher. And uh, Advanced Micro also higher, another of the semi names, uh, up about uh, almost 2% in today's trade, Alex. Yeah, we still have some earnings that are coming out. I mentioned CSX. Uh, the earnings as came in right in line a little bit better, actually. Actually, at 49 cents a share, the estimates were for 48. Revenue bang in line with estimates, 3.7 uh, billion. I was just kind of strolling through the press release here uh, in terms of the performance to see kind of what was growing, where the risks were. Um, I, it doesn't seem to have that kind of color yet, but we'll definitely uh, keep looking on that in terms of their outlook. I know that their operating income looked to decrease about 1% versus the same period last year. Um, but nonetheless, uh, so s relatively solid results from CSX. Okay, we also have earnings out of Avis and, of course, the car rental company. This is a stock that's really declined a lot this year, down about 52%. Second quarter revenue missing the average analyst estimate, $3.05 billion. Analysts were looking for $3.14 billion. International revenue also lighter than anticipated. America's revenue lighter than anticipated. There's a theme here, obviously. And adjusted EBITDA down 71% year over year. Uh, $214 million. Analysts were looking for $254.7 million. All right, we're caught up on Avis earnings now. Take a look at some of the losers in today's market. Uh, much bigger company, NVIDIA, um, was at one point 
um, down like 15% and had lost almost $400 billion of market cap. So this 6% loss doesn't look as bad as it could have been. Nonetheless, obviously, it is uh, at least one of the two world's biggest companies. So a huge drag on the S&P. Apple as well. The Apple story, I think, is fascinating. Warren Buffett has sold, we found out this weekend, half entirely half of his Apple shares. He still has a massive position. Massive. In Apple, um, like 400 million shares. But, uh, and Apple had rallied up into the end of the week, but that um, story hurt Apple shares considerably today. Again, not as bad as they were this morning, um, but we're still closing down significantly on what is a very large company. And then I had a look at, you know, Robinhood and Bitcoin and Coinbase were all down because of the underlying asset. I'm guessing you can trade Bitcoin and Robinhood. It hurt um, that platform. You obviously trade Bitcoin on Coinbase and it hurt that platform. Bigger uh, stock as well. But in general, Bitcoin has been a risk indicator. So with this huge risk off mm -hmm. um, feeling pervasive in the market, Bitcoin at one point was down like 16 percent. I think it's down right now about nine or 10 percent. Yeah. And that is hurting uh, anyone who's related to it. Um, MicroStrategy also a big loser in the market today. All right, I'm taking a look at the bond market. It looks super boring right this second, but <laughs> man, was that a day uh, for a bond trader. What a turnaround. So, I mean, really, at one point, you had the two-year yield down 20 basis points, and now it's up by one basis point. At one point, you had the curve disinverting and holding around two basis points, and then all of a sudden, now we keep uh, inverting. I mean, that is a tremendous move in the bond market, we get supply later on this week for sure. But nonetheless, I mean, I don't know what to make of that price action. 10 a.m. ISM services coming in better than expected. Everything is above 50, which signals growth. Not tremendous growth, but above 50 does signal that things are not contracting, and that's the biggest part of the U.S. economy. Which kind of feels like the environment we're going to be for, what, the next month or so, until we get through Jackson Hole, mm -hmm. until we get to the next Fed meeting. Jay Powell reminded us, like, there's a lot of data points to get through, so you do wonder about how that kind of shapes the trade and whether or not we continue to see more uh, momentum, at least on the yield curve, to the downside. All right, let's get some uh, numbers here on Palantir, because that is also coming out uh, with earnings. So j just the big headline here, on a full year adjusted operating income basis. Uh, they're looking at anywhere between 966 million to 974 million. They were at some point looking for about 882.9 uh, million. So they're raising their full year adjusted operating uh, income. Remember, this company has kind of two businesses, really. It's a government, government revenue-based uh, uh, contracts and mm -hmm. also they're trying to ramp up their commercial business as well with their artificial intelligence platform. So this to be feels like, uh, okay, AI, I can make money from it. Well, plus if they get um, JD Vance into the White House, what an amazing coup this would be for Peter Thiel. I mean, the stock's already up 40%, but imagine the government contracts they could be awarded after that. Yeah, well, the fun, the company was co-founded by Peter, Peter Thiel in 2003, and this is definitely part of the appeal of a company like this, all the recurring revenue that it gets from the U.S. government. One thing we should note is that uh, Palantir says AI has transformed its business, already transformed is the direct quote here. And of course, what people will want to get is the color here on exactly how much of a contribution AI has made to the business. All right, we're looking at Lucid earnings as well. And if you're sitting at home trading this company, let me give you the headlines. The EBITDA loss, or the loss before taxes, interest, um, and depreciation was... $647.6 million. We were looking for $560.9 million. So worse than expected. However, the revenue in the second quarter was $200.6 million. And we were looking for revenue of $185.8 million. So the revenue was better than expected. Of course, it's really all about liquidity with this country. A company, does it have enough cash to stay in business? Um, and so far, it looks like they do because the public investment fund is making a new one and a half billion dollar commitment for Lucid that has got to be good news, mm. I would guess, for the shares. They poured a lot of money into Up the about company. 6%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Up about 6%. They've already 6%. put $3 billion into it. All right. Hims and Hers also out. Hims and Hers Health out. Uh, stock is a little bit lower here in the aftermarket. I'm going to go right to the outlook. Third quarter uh, adjusted EBITDA of 35 to 40 million. The estimate on the street is 33.8. So it does look like that's a beat. Fiscal year adjusted EBITDA of 140 to 155 million. That is an up uh, forecast. It had seen 120 to 135 million. But the stock, which has been a real outperformer, up 100% so far this year in 2024, kind of kicking around right now, 
up about eight tenths of a percent. All right, guys. Whew. Monday. That's a wrap. That was a day. That was a day. <laughs> that was a day. Can't wait to see what Tuesday brings. That's a wrap. Uh, that's going to do it for our cross-platform coverage of the market close on radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg, or Rachel's. We will see you guys again, same time, same place tomorrow.